Amen. Thank you, Debbie. You can tell she's a trained professional. Mike doesn't work. She just rolls on with it. That's what you do. We appreciate that. Boy, that's a beautiful song. I hope you worship through that today. We appreciate Debbie. Appreciate Tabitha for playing for us today. Thank you so much. And, uh, of course, as always, Gary leading us up here. And so we appreciate everyone who stepped up today and filled in some roles. And uh, just a beautiful song. And hopefully that's got us off to a good start today. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn with me to the gospel according to Luke, Luke's gospel chapter number two, and we're going to look at one of the birth narratives today is a very familiar passage, and we're going to look at Luke chapter two, and in just a moment we're going to be, read verses one through twenty. Uh, Lord willing, we'll get back into our study in the book of Ephesians next week, and uh, but I hope you've uh, read some of these. These are very familiar passages of scripture, but I think on Christmas morning, uh, you have to read one of the birth narratives, amen? And uh, if you were here yesterday, Brother Josh Arthur uh, read a passage of Scripture and preached from John chapter 1. Uh, the Word, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the incarnation, God becoming flesh in the person of Jesus Christ and living here on this earth. But you know, many times we want to leave Jesus in a manger because when Jesus is in a manger, we don't have to change our lives. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to obey him and follow him. But listen, folks, he didn't stay as a babe in a manger. As I mentioned earlier, Jesus grew up, lived a perfect sinless life, crucified on a cross, was buried and rose again, and we know he ascended back to heaven. And the Bible tells us today he seats, he seated at the right hand of the Father in glory and one day coming in all that power and glory. And that's why we're here today to celebrate not only the birth of Christ, but we celebrate a risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, today. Amen? Luke's Gospel, chapter number 2. Beginning with verse number 1, we'll read down through verse number 20. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary as a spouse, wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swollen clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a heaven, multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even into Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Now, we know when we're a family's expecting a child, we know that's a very exciting time. And uh, there's great anticipation. There's great news that people hear the news. And it's wonderful news. We all get excited. Some of us laugh. Some of us cry. And it's always a great time. Well, Joseph and Mary had been facing this for some nine months, and they knew that a child was on the way. There was great anticipation, great excitement. Of course, we know that Mary was a young uh, female woman. She was a virgin, maybe 14, 15, 16 years old, and she knew that she was pregnant. She had not had any sexual relationship with any man, but she knew this was conceived in her of the Holy Spirit, a virginal conception, a virginal birth. And so now it's time, and we wonder sometimes, as Isaiah prophesied, as Micah prophesied, going back all the way to the book of Genesis, the seed of the woman, we realize that it had been prophesied that this Messiah would be born, this King of the Jews, this Savior of the world, would come into the world sometime, would come into this earth, and that God would take upon himself flesh, human flesh, 
and become a man and go and to be crucified and rise again that we might have hope and that we might have eternal life and that our sins might be forgiven. So it's been prophesied for years. But now the time had come. In the fullness of time, as Paul writes in the book of Galatians, the fullness of time, it was God's perfect timing, coming at a specific time in history that God would send his son. And he would send his son at the perfect time, the perfect place to the perfect people that we might be saved, that we might have eternal life. Now Luke records this. Of course, Luke is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And Luke records this according to an historical account. And the reason Luke does this, he says, look, Jesus is a real historical person. This isn't some fact or myth or fiction or anything. He says, this is true. This is real. This is something that actually took place at a real time in a real place in history that this took place. Now, remember Joseph and Mary. They were up in Nazareth. Nazareth to Bethlehem is about 65 or 70 miles. It's about a three or four day journey. Uh, today, we would get the vehicle and drive that. Most of you would drive that in about an hour. Some of you might drive it in 45 minutes. Some of you might drive it in an hour and 15, but you see the point. We get there pretty quickly. But in this day and time, they rode horseback or camel or donkey. It took a long time, and Mary's very pregnant. But Joseph and Mary, perhaps they knew. Perhaps God had placed this into their mind. They had to get down to Bethlehem. Because Micah prophesied, the prophet, some six, seven hundred years earlier, that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would be born in Bethlehem. And so we see they had to get down to Bethlehem. Bethlehem simply means the house of bread. Jesus, the living bread, the bread of life that we partake of, and that we're nourished not only physically, but we're nourished spiritually. Now, let's look at this passage today. And as we get down to the shepherds, I'm going to take a little different angle on this today. And I, and I hope you stay with me on this. But in the first seven verses here, we see this historical record of Jesus Christ. It says, it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus. This is the Roman emperor at this time, that all the world should be taxed. That, that's the Roman Empire. Now, this taxing is basically to register for a census, okay? So the Jews would pay taxes. Now, the Jews didn't have to serve in the Roman military, but they would have to pay taxes. And so... Uh, Caesar Augustus sends out and says, you know what, we need to uh, have people register for this census in order that they might be able to pay these taxes. Because remember, Israel at this time, the Jewish nation at this time, was under the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was very large. And so this is happening here. And what's interesting here is God is using a Gentile pagan emperor to get his son where he needs to be. God's sovereignty. Amen. That's God's providence right there, that God is in control of all the situation. And so the taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. This was the province that Israel was in. All went to be taxed, everyone into his own city, his city of birth. And this is showing, I believe, that Joseph is birth, uh, not only that, but also Mary. And Joseph also went up. Now he goes up. He's actually going south, but he goes up in elevation. He goes up because Bethlehem was a little higher elevation. So he goes up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea. Now, if you were in Sunday school this morning, we mentioned a little about Nazareth. Nazareth was kind of a despised city. It was kind of looked down upon. Of course, Jesus would grow up here. Jesus would be called the carpenter from Nazareth. But he would be born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. Why? Prophesied in Scripture some six, 700 years earlier, this is the place he would be born. And, you know, that's what's amazing about the Bible. When you look at the prophecies of the Old Testament, you had just the Old Testament, but along later came the New Testament, which it's one canon of Scripture now, but you see so many prophecies concerning Jesus Christ that have been fulfilled and that will be fulfilled. And so it's showing here that no mere human being could simply make these stories up and write this. You know, it's like someone that lived back in the 14 or 1500s saying, well, the year 2016, you're going to be gathered here at Emmanuel Baptist Church on Christmas Day 2016. Gary's going to lead the singing. Tobias going to play. Debbie's going to sing. And I'm going to preach. They would have no way of knowing that. And so we see here that Micah writes this. Bethlehem, well, what's the big deal about Bethlehem? Well, this is where God said it was going to take place. And so this is where it's going to take place. And so Joseph here went up from Galilee, the city of Nazareth, into Judea, under the city of David. Now, that's very important because Jesus would be in the line of David, the lineage of David. 
He would be the son of David, showing here that Jesus would not only be the Jewish Messiah, but Jesus would be a king. As God had prom promised David back in 1 Samuel, he said, look, David said, I want to build a house for you. I want to build a temple for you. God said, no, I'm going to build a house for you. It's going to be an everlasting kingdom that's going to last forever. And there's going to be one that will sit upon your throne that will never be dethroned. He will be a king not only of the Jews, not only of the Gentiles, but he will be a king of all the world. He will be the Jewish Messiah, the one God's anointed one, the Christ, the one God would send. And so which is called Bethlehem because he was the house, the lineage, the family of King David. Of course, King David comes from the tribe of Judah. Jesus Christ would be called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. It says here, to be taxed with Mary. He was going to be taxed along with Mary as a spouse, wife, being great with child. That's also interesting here at this time. It's a betrothal period. Joseph and Mary are engaged. You know, there's no sexual relationship. They don't live with one another, and it had to take place here because if they were already married, of course, obviously, she wouldn't be a virgin. If it was before the betrothal period, her pregnant and not married, there would be a great scandal. And so this is the time that she had to be pregnant during this year-long engagement or betrothal period. They didn't live together. There were no sexual relationship, but we know she's pregnant. She's ready to have a child, and Joseph has taken her. And remember, Mary could have gone through a lot of public uh, ridicule and mockery and, and uh, been left out in destitute and poverty and prostitution and all this, but Joseph took her. And he said, you know what? God has appeared to me, and God has appeared to Mary, and this is what's taking place. Did Mary understand everything? We sing that song many times. Mary, did you know? Did you know what all was taking place with this Messiah, with this little baby that was in your womb, that it was going to be a special child, and, and this child's going to be great, and he's going to be called the son of the highest, and, and he's going to have the throne of his father David, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Remember earlier in Luke chapter 1, Mary said, hey, I don't understand it all. But God, I, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to be used. I'm available for your use. I'm submissive to you. I don't understand it all. I don't know how it's all going to work out. But I'm available here. And I will. you will use me for your glory. Whatever it means. If it's ridicule, if it's mockery, whatever it is, I'm here and I'm ready to be used for your glory. And that's what she did. And so in verse number 6, while they were there, the days were accomplished, fulfilled, completed, that she should be delivered. It was time to give birth, and she brought forth her firstborn son. I think denoting she had more children after that. Of course, we know after Joseph and Mary, uh, they had regular relationships as a married couple, and Jesus had what we would call half-brothers and half-sisters. And so, but we see here it, throughout the scriptures a virginal conception and a virginal birth of Jesus Christ. He did not have that Adamic nature, that sinful nature of a human being. He was perfect, and he was sinless. Look what she did. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, isn't that interesting? As always mentioned this time of year at Christmas, do you know what? Jesus wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't born in the White House. He wasn't born in a great mansion. He wasn't born to royalty. He didn't have a silver spoon in his mouth. He didn't have this. He didn't have that. And you know what? Earthly speaking, he didn't have all these things. But let me tell you something. The Bible says he created all things. So that means he owns everything, amen? And so this little baby here, born into obscurity and poverty here, into a dirty, smelly stable, and laid in a manger. A manger, manger was a feeding trough for an animal. How dirty and how disgusting. You know, when a baby's born, the baby's placed in the hospital, it's very sterile. We don't want to get germs or anything like that. And we don't take that little baby out for a few weeks because we don't want Uncle Harry here coughing all over that baby and getting it sick, do we? How many of you have an Uncle Harry, amen? If you do, I apologize, okay? We don't want that baby to get sick. And the first time it has a little cough, we take it to the doctor. And we want to make sure it's healthy and, it, and everything's fine with it. And it's, it's good and, and, and perfectly fine, everything. We, we want to do that, but they didn't have that. They didn't have a doctor there. They didn't have a midwife there. They simply had a child there, and she placed it swaddling close. She wrapped it up for security. And for warmth and, and safety, so to speak, they still do that today in many Mid-Eastern countries. But she placed it in a, in a feeding trough for an animal right here. And we're thinking, this is the Messiah? This is God in the flesh? 
this is the Son of God. This is the one that would come and be crucified. This is the one that we would bow to and say he was Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the one that, that we meet together on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday nights to worship. This is the one we exalt. This is the one we sing about and we play instruments about and we preach about and we give our lives to when we follow a little baby laid in a manger. See, it's not what the Jews expected. But you know what's the interesting thing? As we look at this last section of our passage today, I think it's very interesting here. The first news of the Savior's birth came not to royalty, not to the kings, not to the queens, not to the Jewish religious leaders, not to the rich and the powerful and the famous, but it came to a bunch of old, ordinary, common, dirty shepherds. Isn't that amazing? Have you ever thought about that? And you know, if we were to ask the shepherds today, if we were to interview the shepherds, Back at that day, you place yourself back there on that Christmas morning. Jesus had just been born. And you hear the shepherds coming. Maybe there were three, maybe there were four, maybe there were five. I don't know. But you think of these shepherds sitting around here, and you're interviewing them. You're at the local television station, okay? Can you picture that for me for just a moment? Some of you may go out today and say, you know what, preacher? I don't think they had TV back then. I know that, okay? Pretend with me, okay? And so the interviewer comes up to the shepherds and says, Mr. Shepherd, tell me what took place. You have a smile on your face. You have a certain glow on your face today. You know, people look at you, Mr. Shepherd, and they say, well, you're kind of an outcast. A lot of people think you're a thief. You don't go to the temple. You don't go into the city. You stay out in the field 24 hours a day. And you're kind of dirty. And you know what? You don't wear a lot of cologne, okay? You don't smell the best. And you're out there with a bunch of dirty, smelly sheep. And they take a lot of these sheep and they sell them and they take them to the temple to be sacrificed. That's interesting, isn't it? And so, you know, tell me what went on that day. And you're one of the shepherds. And you say, well, let me tell you what happened. We were out in the field minding our own business. And we were out there taking care of the sheep, keeping the predators off. And we were feeding the sheep. We were making sure they were all in line. And, and you know, we just out there talking amongst ourselves, telling stories, and, and just doing what we do every single day. And then all of a sudden, we were out there in the field, and it was kind of dark, and the stars were shining. It was a beautiful night. And all of a sudden, we looked up, and there was a light that we'd never seen before in our life. It was like the whole sky lit up. Now, remember back then, they didn't have street lights. They didn't have lights on houses. Okay, They didn't have all that. It was very dark out there. And all of a sudden, this brilliant, glorious light shines around them. And, and, and they're wondering, what in the world is going on? Is it a comet? Is it a meteor shower? Is the world ending? What's going on here? And maybe they looked at one another and they said, what in the world's taking place? What in the world's happening of this great light? And they're blinded by the light. And then all of a sudden, they hear this angel, the Lord, speaking to them. And they hear this audible voice. And, and if we look in our passage here, they're out keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel, the Lord. Now, this would be an angel of the Lord, a messenger from God. Was it Gabriel? I don't know. It doesn't say. It said, came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And you're interviewing this shepherd, and you say, Mr. Shepherd, what was your reaction when you saw this great light? He said, well, I was terrified. We all looked at one another. We didn't know what was taking place. We were frightened. We were scared. But at the same time, you know what? Not only being overwhelmed, but we got a little excited. We thought maybe, maybe it's something to rejoice about. Maybe it's something to celebrate. We don't know what's taking place. We don't know what's happening right here. And, and, and you know, they, they, perhaps they saw this angel here. And all of a sudden, in verse 10, the angel began to talk to them. Now, what if you were out last night walking in a field, and all of a sudden there's a bright light, and you hear a voice from heaven? You're going to think you had some bad pizza? Amen? You're going to think, what in the world's going on? Wouldn't you be frightened? I'd be terrified. I wouldn't know what to do. I wouldn't know how to act. But I want you to notice there in verse 10, the angel said unto them, fear not. Don't be afraid. There's no reason to be afraid. There's no reason to be frightened. There's no reason to be terrified. And, and you know, you're interviewing this shepherd. The shepherd said, you know what? The angel said, don't be afraid. We were like, Ray, I'm right. Don't be afraid of what we're seeing right here. Because the angel said to us, and this shepherd looks at the interview and says, Here, here's what the angel said to him. said, for behold, I bring you good tidings. The word good tidings is the word euangelion. It's the word for the gospel, the good news. He says, I bring you good news, good tidings 
not only good tidings, but good tidings of great joy, which should be to all people. And you're thinking there, you're one of the shepherds, and you tell the interviewer, you say, you know what? I don't know why we were the first to know. I thought the, the, the religious leaders would know first. I thought this message would go to the kings and the queens and parliament and all these different places right here. We're just common shepherds. We're outcasts. We're sinful human beings. We're out here, we're dirty, we're smelly. And, you know, we're out here with a bunch of dumb sheep walking around with some sheep. I don't know why this message was given to us. But it says, don't, don't be afraid, so I bring you great news. Good news of great joy, and it's going to be to all people. It's not only for you, but it's for everyone. Look what the great news is in verse 11. That's why we celebrate today. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Amen? That's why we're here today. Did you know that? And I want you to see right there. For unto you. You see, Christ was given to us. A child is born. A son is given. Prophet Isaiah mentioned this. Jesus is eternal, but he takes upon human flesh and he enters human history. He enters the earth uh, here, uh, of the world of human beings right here. Jesus enters right here from all of glory. You know, Jesus is eternal. Do you believe that? And let me tell you something too, folks. When Jesus was lying as a baby in a manger, when he was a boy of 12 years old, when he was growing up, he was always God. He never ceased to be God. Did you know that? Never ceased to be God. He didn't lay aside his deity. Do you know that? He, 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 he didn't do it. He was always God and always will be God. And, and so we see right here when he says unto you this day a city of David, a Savior, a Savior of the world. You see, many of the Jews thought, well, this Messiah is going to come and he, he's going to defeat the Romans and we're going to have, uh, you know, we're not going to be under Roman oppression anymore. We're going to be free. And he's going to heal diseases and he's going to do that, which he would do that. But the greatest thing is he would come to save them from their sins. See, the Bible says we've all sinned come short of the glory of God. We all need Christ, okay? Whether you believe that or not, that's the truth. And so he's going to come, and he's going to save people, and he's going to heal people physically, and he's going to be the Messiah and the Savior of the world. He's the Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And it's interesting here because Christ is the Messiah, God's anointed one. Not only Christ, but he's going to be the Lord, the sovereign Lord of the universe. Now, you're one of the shepherds there, and I'm interviewing you. What did you think? When this angel came to you and said, Unto you is born this day in the city of David, in Bethlehem, a Savior which is Christ the Lord. We didn't know what to think. We'd heard there was a Christ coming. We heard there was a Messiah coming. We didn't know the significance of that. We can't go to the Jewish temple. We can't go and make sacrifice. We're banned from there because we're outcasts. We're sinners. We're thieves. People don't like us. People don't care about us. People don't know who we are. But the interviewer asked the shepherd, said, Well, God must know who you are. God must be concerned about you. God must care about you because God sent this message to you. And you know what? No one else knew about this except you few little three, four, five shepherds right here. Oh, the privilege and the honor of having this message to you. And then the angel said unto us, the shepherds, said, you know what? There's going to be a sign. There's going to be evidence, proof. Unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. Well, it wasn't uncommon for to go in the town and, and see babies wrapped in swaddling clothes because that's what they did at that time. Secure limbs and for warmth and safety and security. But the interesting thing is not only would this baby be wrapped in swaddling clothes, this little baby would be lying in a manger. You don't find that every day, okay? You know, putting a baby in a feeding trough for an animal, you just don't find that every day. Some people believe it was a little cave, a little insert there in a cave. And, and so you see here, that's poor, that's poverty, that's dirt, that's filthiness. That's not what we expect the Messiah. But you know what? The shepherds had enough sense to know maybe the Messiah is not going to be born in the palace. Do you know that? Maybe he's going to come in obscurity and poverty and, and, and filth right here because this message goes to sinful human beings. She will be assigned to you in verse 13. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Glory and excelsis Deo. That's where we get that right there. Shepherd, what did you think? Well, we saw one angel, and that kind of freaked us out. That kind of frightened us. And this angel spoke to us and said, hey, don't fear. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And then all of a sudden, as we were standing there, we were mulling over this and trying to get this in our mind. All of a sudden, there was an angelic choir that I've never seen before in my life. And there were angels upon angels and myriads of angels and angels and angels and angels. And notice what they were saying. 
Glory to God in the highest in the heaven and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. This is what Jesus would do. Jesus would bring glory to God. He would bring peace upon the earth and goodwill or good favor toward men. You know what's interesting about this? You go to the last book of the Bible, the book of the Revelation, and you see there when Jesus is enthroned, it talks about myriads and myriads of angels. What are they doing? They're falling down at the throne and they're praising and saying, Worthy is the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus Christ. Universal adoration, universal worship. But it's like heaven's pent up ecstasy here. It's like heaven's sitting there and they're thinking, Boy, we just can't wait to, to praise God for this. And this angel steps out and says, hold on a minute, let me tell them first, and then I'll let you break out in song. And he tells the shepherds, and you're the shepherd, you say, hey, I was listening to this angel, and then all of a sudden, there's this humongous choir. And how would you like to lead that choir, Debbie? Wouldn't that be nice? She says she already has an angelic choir, amen? All right. But, but the thing about it, 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 it is all of a sudden all this song and praise, glory to God the highest on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. I mean, can you imagine that? What you're if a shepherd sitting there? And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go into Bethlehem and see this saying which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. So, Mr. Shepherd, what did you do? Well, we saw the angel, we saw this choir, and, and you know, we were overwhelmed. We didn't know what to think. And we began to talk amongst ourselves. We said, Hey, let's go see this for ourselves. You know, they had to believe it, didn't they? They'd believe it by faith, didn't they? They had seen the Messiah. They had seen the manger. They had seen Joseph or Mary. They had to take it by faith. Are you with me? They'd believe it by faith. And they looked and said, hey, let's go here and let's find out for ourselves what's going on here. Because they said this baby's going to be wrapped in swaddling clothes, going to be lying in a manger. So we need to go see. Wouldn't you do that when curiosity gets the best of you? You know, many times when you see a, an ambulance going somewhere or a fire truck, what do you do? You do what you're not supposed to do. You go follow and say, I've got to see this. Curiosity. And they said, hey, one to another. We, we, we looked at one another and said, hey, we're going. Let's, let's go right now. And so they go. And they go into Bethlehem. You know, just a couple of miles outside the city there where they're at. And they go in there. Now, remember, they never went to town. They weren't really accepted in town. They weren't really welcomed in town. They weren't really received in town. People didn't like them. They kind of looked down on them. They're kind of dirty, and they're considered outcasts and thieves and simple people. But you know what? They said, we don't care. But it's interesting here that when they went to the stable, to Joseph and Mary and Jesus, they were welcomed there. Do you know that? They were received. They weren't considered outcasts. They were, hey, you don't belong in here. You're not allowed to come in here. You're not allowed to come in the temple. You see, there were barriers there. But then the angel spoke, and, and, and the shepherd said, let's go. And Mr. Shepherd, what did you do? Well, we got there. And we got there, and, and, and it was a stable. It's not what we thought. It was dirty and smelly and grimy. And there was a man named Joseph, and there was a young woman named Mary, very pretty little woman. And they had just given birth, and, and we looked down in that manger, and we saw someone. We saw someone that when we saw him, we, we just had a chill over him. Oh, he's a little baby. He's a cute little baby. And he, he's, he's swallowing clothes there. He's a nice looking little baby. But there's something different when we looked at this child. And so they came in verse 16 with haste, with urgency. And notice they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. When they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told to them concerning this child. Notice in verses 16 and 17, they came, they found, they saw, and they made known. I'm interviewing you, Mr. Shepherd. What did you do when you saw this child? We didn't know what to do. We saw this child we knew was special, knew was unique. Did you, hold it, did you hold the news in? Did you just keep it among yourself? Mr. Shepherd says, no, that's too good a news to hold. We went into town. We're not really welcome there. People don't really receive us. They don't really like us. But we went in, and I saw a neighbor, and I told him what I'd, done, what I'd seen. And, and this other shepherd said, oh, I, w I went over here to the grocery store, and I, I, I told them what I saw. I told them about this little child. This child had been prophesied that was born to Joseph and Mary, and there was something different and something unique about this little baby. We couldn't keep it quiet. We had to go out and tell. And you know what? Listen, folks, the first evangelists were shepherds. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is the good shepherd who gives his life for his sheep. And so they made it known. But notice in verse 17, the last part of verse 17, did they go out and did they say, oh, let me tell you about the angels and the choir and Joseph and Mary and our journey. They didn't talk about that. Who did they talk about? 
this child. We talk about Jesus. Let us tell you about Jesus. In verse 18, all they that heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherd. Can we believe this? Mr. Shepherd, what did the people do when you told them? Well, some didn't believe us. Some thought we was crazy. Some thought, hey, there's something going on out here. What's going on? And then some people, you know what? They thought, well, we know there's a Messiah going to be born, but you wouldn't know about this, shepherd. You're out in the field. No one likes you. No one cares about you. Shepherd said, no, we've seen it. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. You know, it goes back to that song, Mary, did you know? Did, did you know what was taking place, Mary? I don't know what all Mary knew. But Mary knew this son that she had given birth to was a very special child. Amen. She knew he was unique. She knew he was supernatural. She knew that he wasn't like any other child. She knew this. And she knew that, hey, there's something different about this child. But I want you to close with verse number 20 as we close. The shepherds return, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they'd heard and seen as was told unto them. Mr. Shepherd, you've seen this, you've seen the child. What did you do after that? Well, you know, we were kind of amazed. We didn't know what to think. And we looked at each other and we said, you know what? It's time to go back to work. We're going to go back to our faithful job. And we're going to go back to these dirty, smelly sheep. And we're going to go back to, you know, people don't really like us. People are not concerned about us. We're going to go back to doing what we do every single day. But let me tell you something, Mr. Interviewer. When we returned that particular night back to our field, our lives have never been the same. Our lives have been changed. Our lives have been drastically changed. Because you know what? We're, we're beginning to realize and understand that we have seen the face of God. Amen? We've seen the face of God. We've seen the Savior. Oh, he's a little baby here. But when we saw him, there's something different about him. There's something unique about him. And see, they returned. When they came to Bethlehem, they didn't say they was praising God and glorifying God and all that. They came back, and they were dancing and praising God. And people probably looked at them and said, what in the world are these shepherds doing? And no, no doubt they said, hey, we, we, we've seen someone that's very special. We've seen Jesus. You see, when you have an experience with Jesus Christ, your life will never be the same. It'll never be the same. Now, we, we leave the story with the shepherds. We don't know what happened to them. We don't know where they went from here. And today's people think, well, we don't know who they are. We don't know their names. We're not concerned about them. But let me tell you something. God was concerned about them, wasn't he? God knew who they were. God appeared to them. In this, form, this, this angel appeared to them and said, here, you go see the Savior. And they went and saw him. And you know, today people are seeking things. They're seeking, where can I find truth? Where can I find happiness? Where can I find fulfillment? They found it. Not in a creed, not in a church, not in a community. They found it in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope we can all go from here today and say, you know what? I came today on Christmas morning. I know Jesus, but I've had an experience with Christ today, and I'm going to walk out these doors today, and I'm never going to be the same because I've had an experience with Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Father, we thank you today. We thank you today for this glorious message that we have for us recorded in the gospel according to Luke. We're thankful for the incarnation. We're thankful for this story of the shepherds. And we see how they reacted. And we see what they did. And we see the results of that. As they maybe not understood everything, but they went away praising and glorifying you for all they'd heard, all they'd seen. Their lives were never the same. And Lord, we know when we come and have an experience with Jesus Christ, our lives will never be the same. Father, I pray today as we give this time of invitation on this Christmas morning, maybe there's someone here today who's never received Christ as Savior. Father, may you speak to their heart today. May they realize that the Bible tells us all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. May they repent of their sins today, and may they right now place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Jesus, I believe you died for me. I believe you were buried and rose again. I believe that. And I accept you today. And I want to go to heaven one day. And the only way I'm going to go to heaven is through you by accepting you. There may be other needs here today. Father, we just pray you'll have your will and your way in our service today. And God, we do thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And help us not only to exalt him on this Christmas morning, but may we exalt him every day of our lives. 
And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What number of the